Welcome back, AP Calc BC friends. Mr. Record here from Avon High School, and we are going to be taking a look at a very interesting topic, a very interesting way of computing some integrals. And I want to make sure that it's quite obvious that this particular process is something that's not going to be tested on the AP Calculus BC exam, because I don't want to get a lot of email from people that say, well, wait a minute, there is no topic 615. I realized that the CED doesn't have a topic 615. What I did is I just added a few additional topics to kind of round out our AP Calc BC course that we have at our school at Avon High School. And I wanted to really highlight on a few techniques that are very traditionally going to be taught in your Calculus 2 course. So if you skip Calculus 2 and go on to Calculus 3, at least you'll know that these are things that had been taught and uh, you could easily brush up on them by watching the videos, or if you happen to repeat Calculus 2 or take Calculus 2 for the, for the first time, you'll at least uh, have some exposure by watching the videos. So trigonometric integrals, that's the title of this particular technique. It obviously involves trigonometry. It obviously involves integrals. So let's get started and take a look. This great idea. So what we're going to be looking at in, is basically a, a formation of an integrand that will typically consist of a sine word multiplied with a cosine word, but you're going to see those words raised to some higher exponents. It's not going to be the simple situation where only one of those has an exponent and the other one is raised to the first power, because if that were the case, it's a pretty easy U substitution that you could use with your AB knowledge. Later on in the video series over this topic, we'll talk about ones that might join up secants and tangents in the same kind of situation. But I want to focus a little bit more on just the sine and cosine for this video. And so basically, what's going to happen is that we are going to have to be very confident in using a few trig identities. One of the trig identities is probably something that you're very familiar with, and that's our good friend, the Pythagorean identity. It finds itself showing up all the time with these trigonometric integrals. But there are a pair of other trigonometric uh, identities that you're probably not quite as familiar with. These are both manipulations of the half angle identity. And so if you took the half angle identity and kind of played around with it and, and, and structured it in such a way that it solves for a different uh, component, you would find yourself able to solve for both sine squared of x and cosine squared of x. Two very difficult things to normally integrate, but once they are written as these two expressions, they aren't so bad at all. And uh, you could always watch other videos here on YouTube that talk about how to derive either of those identities. Those are just found in a, a normal trigonometric type of uh, course, trigonometry course. Now, with that being said, if we were going to focus a little bit more intently on forms that involve sine and cosine as we prepare for our example one, what we're going to see here is really one of three things happening. In this case, we might have the power of sa sine that's odd and, of course, positive. Or we might have the power of cosine that's odd and positive. Whichever one of those you see, you have to lock into the fact that odd is evil. You don't want an odd exponent. They're very difficult to work with. And so what you'll end up doing is what we call saving a sine factor or saving a cosine factor. I'll show you exactly what that means here in just a little bit. And then we convert the remaining factors in terms of the other trig word. What? Save a sine factor and convert everything else to cosine? Save a cosine factor and, and convert everything else to sine? Let's take a look at our example. So what we've got here is the integration of sine cubed of x times the cosine to the fourth power of x, just like I described some pretty large exponents of sine and cosine that aren't just our typical one powers. So we look very first of all at which one is odd, because odd is evil. And so it doesn't take a whole lot to determine that this 3 is our odd power. 
And so what that means, we want to peel off a sine of x. So in other words, we physically take one of our powers of sine, which reduces that to a sine squared. And what I'm going to do is write that power of sine towards the end here of the interval. I'm going to put it right at the end, just before the differential dx. Now, why on earth would I do something like that, you might think? Well, the whole idea is to make this your candidate for your du. You want to let u be something that has a derivative that will equal that du. And what better u to let equal, to let equal u, to, what better u to use than the cosine? Because we know that the derivative of the cosine is going to land yourself pretty darn close to a derivative of sine of x. I think we might be off by a negative, but we can easily fix that. Now, we have something else to do before then, because if you remember our, our terminology, our little uh, tip on the previous page said, once you peel off that odd power, you, mean, you will want to convert all of the rest of this expression in terms of cosine. And so we want that sine squared to be written as a cosine. And that's not very difficult to do because we have a trig identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So that would mean sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared. And now the stage is set. OK, so we're going to go ahead and do our u substitution. And we're going to let u equal that cosine that we talked about. Because we know that the derivative of that cosine is our negative sine exactly what we want, almost, except for the negative S-I-G-N, but that's something that's very easy to fix because if we just bring out a negative, that negative multiplied by the du that we're going to write in this spot, basically it makes this equivalent to positive sine of x dx, thus replacing what we had in our integrand. Now remember, we let u be cosine, and so we have 1 minus u squared times u to the fourth du. And the beautiful thing about that is that it's not very hard to integrate. You're just going to have to distribute your u to the fourth in, giving us, of course, u to the fourth minus u to the sixth du. Very easily, we can take that antiderivative. I'm going to put the negative out in front here so that I can make sure that it applies to both terms. Integrating u to the fourth is, of course, u to the fifth over five. Drop the minus. Integrate u to the sixth is u to the seventh over seventh. You've got your plus c. The only thing that you need to do is back substitute. Let's go ahead and replace our u with the cosine. And so that will take us to a final answer of negative quantity cosine fifth power of x over 5 minus a cosine seventh power of x over 7 plus c. Now, it's very likely that this could appear in a lot of different forms if you were taking maybe some kind of a multiple choice assessment. Perhaps the most common form would be the distribution of the negative and then the flipping of the order, maybe cosine seventh over seventh with a positive comes first, and then I would subtract cosine fifth of x over five plus c. There's probably not going to be too much other variation. Um, yes, we could get a common denominator. I'm not going to take the time to show you that, but it's just a matter of multiplying this by a five, multiplying this by a seven, and placing it all over 35. So a few other types of variations. I definitely encourage you to take a look at a, any type of uh, computer algebra system, TI Inspire at our school. I would like for my students to type this into your TI Inspire, check the answer, see how it compares with our pencil and paper method here. But in a nutshell, that's really what you do for sine, uh, cosine type of arrangements in your integrands. Uh, I have another example coming up that's going to have a slight variation on this when you have uh, a, another kind of entity uh, in your integrand. So I want you to make sure that you check out example one 
if you want some more practice in dealing with trigonometric integrals that involve sine and cosine. Anyway, hope this helps. We'll see you next time.